Hey, everybody, and welcome back to this second episode of Boggy Update. I am one of your hosts, Christopher Saul, and I am the publisher of Midbay News. And with me again, as always, is Paul Schobert, local entrepreneur and gentleman extraordinaire. And we are going to cover all the stuff that's happening around our little piece of paradise today. Uh, and would love to get your comments and thoughts and questions and angry screeds. Uh, so put them in the comment section of wherever you're watching this, and we will get back to you at some point very soon. Surely less than 24 hours, I will, I will send something to you. Anyway, we have a lot to talk about, so I am going to just kind of get right into it uh, for this week. Uh, the one story that we kind of teased last week and we were going to talk about really in depth this week is a story by our mutual friend, John Salmon, who has uh, written an article about the lawsuit that involves the National Association of Realtors. And it is, it's a dense piece. It has to be just naturally because it's a lawsuit, right? Um, but Paul, can you kind of explain what's going on and how John explains what's going on to the public about what is going on with this lawsuit and what does it mean for the average home buyer or home seller? Yeah, shout out to John Salmon at Salt and Light Realty. He definitely did a great job at uh, delving into the the issue and the uh, the overarching settlement agreement. Um, uh, the National Association of Realtors has been fighting this issue as long as there's been realtors on how to um, handle commissions just in general. And I think the general consumer out there thinks that the commissions are set. Uh, if you talk to somebody, they'll say it's 5% split between both agents. Some will say 6% split between both agents. But ultimately, commissions have always been negotiable. Um, and so it's a bit of a nothing burger I think, uh, I think, I think it, it was good for headlines and I think it's definitely going to drive some changes to how realtors do things, but there's a lot of misconceptions out there. And a lot of them, John tackled things like the settlement forces, real estate brokers to decrease compensation. That's just false. It doesn't do that. Uh, the settlement will, for the first time ever, allow sellers to no longer pay, you know, compensation for, for bringing a buyer in, that's also false. Um, the settlement prohibits sellers from paying a commission to a buyer's agent and relieves sellers of any financial burden. Therefore, you know, they can make more money uh, selling their home. That's false. Um, it's going to somehow lower prices and make home ownership affordable again. I think that is a talking point that <laughs> that is absolutely ridiculous and you, you probably won't see happen. Um, but that the, uh, you know, the powers that be in politics would, would have you believe. Um, and then, you know, there is, uh, there is a portion of the settlement where people are supposedly going to get paid some money. I think that too is not going to be all that significant. I think someone out there has done the math and they said that, you know, if you were actually to be a claimant in, in the lawsuit, um, the average person may get like $10 or something. Um, so it's a big number with millions of dollars attached to it. Uh, but the real winners, to be honest with you, are the lawyers who I'm sure made 80 to a hundred million dollars, uh, in fighting this case. Um, they're the only ones who made any real money. Well, hey, you know, good for them, I guess. I don't know. Uh, but <laughs> like you said, it, it kind of seems like nothing really changes. Um, other than well, there'll, be some, there'll be some changes in how realtors interact with one another and how commissions are are communicated. Um, and again, I would encourage everybody to go read John's article because he definitely delves into that. Um, and I think it sent a lot of people in the real estate industry swirling on trying to figure out how we're now going to handle the communication of um, commissions. Um, but, I, you know, I just think in the long run, they're going to figure out what those, how to handle those issues and, um, you know, we'll move forward and the market will ultimately dictate how much realtors get paid. Um, not the settlement. So speaking of the market dictating that kind of stuff, um, it kind of feels like maybe, I don't know if the plateau is the right word, but I've seen sort of a flattening compared to the last five years, uh, of home price increases. Uh, do you think that's something that is actually going to become a pattern, um, over the long haul? I guess since we're a local show, we can just talk about locally, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, as someone who invests here locally in real estate, um, I'm definitely seeing properties stay on the market a little bit longer. Um, maybe values are flattening a bit. I would not say that there is some downtick um, or or anything, but it does seem to be a, a more balanced market between buyer and seller. 
um, which I think for a market is overarchingly good. Um, so we'll just have to see a lot of macro economics kind of factor into that, um, you know, with where interest rates are headed and how people feel about that. Um, and a lot of people in our area are holding on to properties that they normally would have sold, have them at low interest rates, and they'd rather hold on to them and rent them um, if they move out of the area than, uh, than sell them. So, I mean, that's, you know, what I've seen several close friends and family members do is, you know, they get move, they get orders to move. And instead of letting go of that house that they have at 2%, right, they rent it out and then, you know, they'll come back and maybe buy a new house buy and make that an investment property, the original one, because their family's gotten bigger or they have different needs uh, as they come back for their second tour of duty at Eglin. Um, I, ultimately, though, uh, it, flat is good, I guess, you know, because there's some sort of balance in the force, as it were. Um, yeah, it can. But, I guess it depends on which side you're on. Yeah. Uh, moving moving from the actual houses to the reason that many people are here, um, the, the Navy is having a string of tests uh, over the next week starting uh, today, tonight, um, actually. And uh, you might see some interference, especially the closer you are to base uh, on your GPS. And so... Something to look out for. Uh, I'm assuming it's not going to be that big of a of a change, but I could be wrong. It could fry everybody's GPS for 20 miles, and we could all be doomed and have to like get MapQuest or something. I don't know. Um, but they have warned about it and said that there will be some interference. So uh, keep your heads keep your heads on a swivel for that. Uh, at least in the short term until April the 10th. Yeah, the base always does a great job of communicating uh, with the local area when they have things going on. It's the first one that I remember in a long time that has anything outside of, you know, just hearing jet plane noises or some funny lights in the sky. Um, so, you know, shout out to them for uh, over communicating. And uh, it is pretty cool when when the weird things like this happen in our area because of our military friends. So somebody somebody out there knows a lot more than you and I do about this one. Um, but I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, shout out to Ilka Cole, the uh, public affairs officer over there at Eglin, for always keeping us informed and giving me a little bit of fodder for uh, the uh, jet noise uh, community. Uh, throw that up there on Facebook, and I'm bound to get a pretty good response of, you know, either Sound of Freedom types or This Is Loud types. Um, so I, I guess it stirs the pot a little bit. Uh, so not bad for me. Uh, but yeah, just heads up, April 1st through 10th, GPS might be a little weird, especially close to base, especially at night. And moving forward, I uh, had a really interesting interview <clears throat> with uh, city manager David Deitch earlier this month, and I was able to get it out last week, uh, the whole finished product. But basically, he talked about wanting to bring more child care facilities uh, to the area. And this is really interesting because our our area, of course, desperately needs more child care. Uh, I can tell you as somebody that has to find child care for my kids, uh, I'm not I'm not enjoying that um, that Odyssey like quest. But if you look at the uh, if you look at how the flip side is for most people in America, they're seeing a downsizing of the child care facilities because of uh, uh, COVID relief money that has run out. And so something like 70,000 uh, facilities or some large number. And I'd have to go actually look into the story. That might be 70,000 employees and not 70,000 people. Uh, let's just check for, uh, yeah, 70,000, 70,000 facilities are going to close, um, across the country because they just don't have the funding to keep open. And we are very much trying to swim against that current because again, we have a lot of young people, a lot of young airmen that are coming here. Um, they're opening up, uh, we're breaking ground on a new child care facility in Crestview that's supposed to serve uh, the Army uh, soldiers up uh, north of Eglin that uh, work on Camp Rudder and, and that northern part of the Eglin Range. Uh, but ultimately, I, I guess my question to you as somebody that looks at more macro economic stuff is how do you see the impact of child care? on the rest of the local economy, because I see it as something that is almost like a linchpin. Like if I wanted to destroy the effectiveness of Eglin Air Force Base, I would get everybody in the childcare industry to call it sick for a day. You know, now that my kids are bringing home a bunch of art from their preschools, uh, it's kind of starting to stack up, or at least it used to until I got Deer. Deer is an app that you can get on your phone 
that allows you to scan all of your kids' art and macaroni shell necklace art paintings and you know coloring and stuff like that into one place and then you can throw it away when they're not looking and keep those memories forever so that you have them but you don't have the clutter that goes with it again that's the deer app check them out on the app store you can thank me later yeah that would that would put a dent in national security wouldn't it yeah. um yeah i i think this is uh one of those foundational services um, that uh, is needed to have a functioning society, uh, especially uh, nowadays where it seems like you have to almost have dual income um, to kind of reach uh, that American dream. Uh, and we know how expensive real estate and everything else is uh, here in the area. So, yeah, I mean, I think this is I think this is great. This is another example of city government getting involved and in trying to do something better um, for for the folks uh, in the area. And uh, obviously, I think it helps the mission immensely if if, um, if parents know that their kids are going to be safe um, and uh, while they go and go to work uh, and go to work for our country. So. Yeah, good job, good job, David Deitch and, and the city council on on taking a look at this as as a problem. And you know, do I want so many of them that we're now complaining about it on Facebook that oh they're breaking ground on yet another daycare facility? I mean, I'd rather be saying that I guess than uh, storage facilities or uh, or oil change places. Somebody made the joke on the uh, on the Facebook machine earlier this week that said they were actually going to put daycare facilities in some of the storage unit facilities. With, to which I said, "Whatever, man, just just get me some capacity up in here." Um, smart, smart. So I will take it. Um, the also in Niceville, but more county looking. Um, the county commission has voted to uh, fund the planning and design of. The Field of Dreams, Miracle League uh, ballpark over there at Meg's Park, which is kind of to the west of City Hall. Uh, the idea being that people with special needs can go there and, uh, you know, take part in specially designed, you know, leagues and tournaments of, you know, baseball or kickball or what, whatever you want to do, track and field. Um, <clears throat> and so I, I guess I'm excited about this because Little Niceville, population 16,000, is going to have the only t field of this type between um if you triangulate it between tallahassee panama city and pensacola and so we're going to become sort of a hub for the special needs community uh and it's going to be paid for with uh tourist development dollars which kind of gives me the mind that hey this is also going to bring a net benefit for our local economy in addition to doing something that's the right thing to do right yeah, absolutely. So I have a I have a cousin who's special needs, and up into his mid to late twenties, he was utilizing facilities like this um, and playing baseball and and doing those type of things. and And so I think this is great. Uh, an example of uh, multiple jurisdictions working together, right? The the county working with the city and um, and making sure that something like this can be put in. And um, yeah, there's there's starting to be a, a you know a few areas in Niceville where um, out of towners are coming um, for very specific reasons. Um, you know, whether it's our baseball field for people up north to come down and, and play tournament games during spring break, um, whether it's the you know the Emerald Coast Classic at the college or, or various other things that are held at the college. So, you know, this is just one more to add to the list, and I think it's um, it's a great opportunity for the special needs community here locally. Um, but like you said, I think it, I think it will drive some folks, um, down here to, um, participate. People who may not have been to Niceville before and, and then they'll go and take advantage of the beaches and everything else while they're here. Absolutely. Uh, final thing on our news list for this week, holes in tents. Um, the County Commission also decided to hold, they're going to hold the public hearing next week to talk about the, the dip, the depth, excuse me, of the holes that you dig on the beach. Uh, according to a proposed ordinance, they would be two foot, uh, what is it? Three foot by three foot and then two foot deep. What say you, Paul Schoberg? Oof. Government overreach or safety the, protocol? The, the digging hole at the beach police. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, listen, I, I thought at first that this was sort of like, uh, an overreach type situation. It seemed kind of silly, but there's definitely been some problems 
um, in the state of Florida with this. I think a young girl in South Florida um, passed away falling falling into one of these holes. Um, and you know nobody likes to to fall into a hole where they didn't see it coming and, and hurt themselves. Um, so I understand the the importance of it. Um, I just I wouldn't want that job to go around and, and tell kids they gotta stop you know digging uh, at the beach because that seems. Can you to see be that county issued measuring tape? Like yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're gonna give them a stick that that meets the parameters exactly, exactly, um, so that they can go check it. And I I get why why they're putting it into effect um and and going towards that, but uh it it does seem uh does seem like an odd thing to to be doing, but I get why they're doing it. I mean, and I get the I in all seriousness, I do get why they want to do something like this. I'm not gonna knock it that hard or that much harder than I already have. Um, but I, I think that the, the biggest issue is going to be enforcement, right? Like who, who are they going to hire to do this? I know they have beach ambassadors and all these other people, but they also have other duties, right? And so I am interested to see if there will be, uh, funding that accompanies this ordinance, uh, because honestly, I, I believe that without funding, you can make any ordinance you want and just see it not enforced. So, um, if they put money behind it. I will be much more interested uh, in the outcome of this public hearing than if they just pass it and say, don't dig holes deep. Yeah. The, I actually think the tent size one is so, sort of interesting. I mean, uh, I don't, I don't know who got to decide what the uh, appropriate tent side was, but I think the regulation suggests 10 by 10 is the mm -hmm. maximum you're allowed to have. Unless you get a permit. Um, unless you get a permit. Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, I guess that's good. It stops people from um, setting up some massive structure and blocking everybody's view and kind of monopolizing the beach. And I know they're using it as a reason to, you know, because these tents obstruct public access or, mm -hmm. or some safety hazard. But I think in general, it's just better for all of us that if we're not setting up ginormous structures on the beach. It's uh, kind of, it's kind of sad that it's like, day. it's sad that it's kind of like come to this like regulation standpoint where it's gotten bad enough to where the County commission has said, we've got enough complaints about this that you guys like, can't do this on your own that we have to step in and say 10 by 10 and two feet deep and all these other rules but that's just one man's opinion so yeah i mean i guess it's going to come down to how they enforce it just you know we had that we had those issues a couple of years ago with the mean water line and mm -hmm. private beaches and all that kind of stuff so um i don't think these will cause as, as much of an issue these changes but i guess we'll wait and see right on well off to our next segment which i am test running this week called buying and selling. And basically the idea is you would buy the stock if you think it's going to go up and you sell the stock if you think it's going to go down. But we're talking about local stuff. So for example, uh, my first one is Northwest Florida State College basketball. As you might remember, both the men's and women's team went to the national playoffs uh, in Casper, Wyoming for the women and Hutchison, Kansas for the men. Well, and as of the taping of this show, the, the men, of course, are out last week in the quarterfinals, but the women have made it all the way to the final where they're going to play Hutchison, Kansas in Casper. Uh, so that game airs tonight as we record it um, at, I believe it's seven o'clock central time. They'll be playing the Hutchison Dragons and they are the Hutchison is the number one overall seed to Northwest Florida's number three overall seed. So an exciting game. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's it's sad that the uh, the guys didn't make it a little bit further, but Coach DeMeo's got those guys uh, headed in the right direction, and he knows what it takes to be successful. He's done it done it before at this level, and um, so I guess at this point we we rally around the girls. Yeah, ESPN Plus tonight. You can watch That's them. That's awesome. Um, so I'm excited about that. I'll be watching with uh, my in laws. They're big basketball people, and uh, I will get um. Patrick, who, if you don't know, is A, my son, and B, is absolutely insane about basketball, though I haven't determined if it's just about the round object or if it's about the game itself. Uh, that will be decided this evening when we watch him instead of the game. And uh, the other thing that I am buying this week is affordable housing. Um, <clears throat> you know, we've been talking a lot about affordable housing here in the last couple of months, and I am of the opinion that I think that that north uh, part of the Eglin golf course is is not long for this world as a golf course and will instead be used uh, to build some affordable or attainable or whatever the keyword that you guys want to use for houses that don't cost half a million dollars. Uh, they still might. I don't know. Um, but ultimately, I think that they're going to get that um, 
fee simple from the federal government and be able to build something with that. And it's probably going to take a lot of different agencies, the city, the county, uh, our state representative. Uh, I mean, they might even get the water district involved at this point. Um, but there's one thing for sure. Niceville needs uh, affordable housing if it wants to expand at all. Um, it's not really a place where we can build a whole lot. I mean, I guess we could build more, you know, half million or half million dollar homes. But uh, at some point, we got to fill them with somebody that's not, um, you know, making $200,000 a year. Uh, and my hope is, is that they'll use this land to do that so that we can have a little bit of uh, uh, levels elevated stuff. So you could start somewhere and sell that house and move up. Um, but yeah. that that's why I'm buying it. What do you think? I'm I'm putting a hold on that one per, personally, just because I haven't seen enough yet on from the government perspective on whether or not that's going to be successful. Um, you know, so I'm sort of in a wait and see on that one. And you know, I would love for people to uh, or someone or anyone really <laughs> to give me a definition of affordable or attainable housing. Um, it's what I can ask, afford. That's affordable. Yeah, well, if you ask one person, it's one number. If you ask another person, it's another number. Um, I don't think uh, I, I don't think we have a good uh, a good angle on that. And no, and no matter no matter what gets built there, uh, you know, someone's going to think it's too expensive. Still, mm -hmm. you're exactly right. Well, here's to hoping that uh, many people will be able to be housed in that area, and it will be a doable prospect. But hey, maybe not. Uh, on the selling side for me, I'm looking at uh, current daycares. Um, my hope is that this whole daycare thing will actually work out and we'll see a uh, an expansion of the number of daycare facilities. And so uh, with that, of course, the market will get more competitive. And so if I am holding daycare stock, uh, I'd probably be selling because I'm, I'm optimistic that they're going to bring more daycares in here. Yeah, I mean, it'd be a good use of uh, of commercial property and commercial zoning. Um, definitely would prefer one of those going up rather than uh, a car wash or uh, a storage facility. So, um, yeah, I'm with you on that one. All right, absolutely. And then the last of my selling is a twofer. Both warm clothes and visiting destined for anything I am selling. <laughs> Uh, the, the spring breakers are here and, uh, soon after them will be the, uh, the summer crowds. And so your boy is, uh, both getting rid of his very cozy sweaters and, uh, other warm such things and, uh, visiting Destin in any way, shape or form. I'll see you in October, Destin. I do love you, but I will see you in October. Yeah, the only time I'm going to Destin is in the early morning uh, before anyone else wakes up and sneak a walk in the beach or something like that. Um, obviously, 98 and how busy everything gets doesn't make it fun for us locals. And uh, I'm with you on the warm weather. I, I don't think we could have had a better Easter weekend. Mm -hmm. I hope everybody got to spend time with their friends and family and spend some time outside. I mean, it was an absolutely stunning uh, Emerald Coast uh, Easter weekend. So I'm, I'm with you on that. I want to add one more to selling. Uh, yeah. I'm selling on coffee. Uh, I think I think there's room in that there's another coffee establishment or chain opening up in Niceville, and I'm wondering how many more coffee places can we have. I am glad you brought that up because I have I have gotten it confirmed, and the story will be out this this afternoon, this evening. Uh, hopefully, when I get the full permit from the city. But a seven brew, which I thought was surely started by a seventh special forces guy, but is not. Um, we'll be in between the Zaxby's and the Po folks uh, of uh, regional uh, Maryland delicatessen fame. Um, but yeah, so seven, uh, seven Brew out of Rogers, Arkansas, with 211 locations, will be coming to Niceville. And I agree, that's, that's a lot of coffee shops. We've got, I would say, at least 10. Well, shout out to the ones I like to go to, yeah. right? So shout out to Tango 3, mm -hmm. uh, shout out to Cafe Bienville, shout out to Wanda Coffee, shout out to MJ's. Uh, I visit all of your places on a regular basis, and, and uh, I appreciate all of you uh, who are doing that local business thing. And, you know, I know there's a couple of other coffee places out there, too, that, that people like, but those are my Shout favorites. out to all the OGs, the OG yeah. coffee places, all right? We're not talking about you, Cumberland Farms. <laughs> No. Like we're not. No. It'd like, be great I'd... if we could uh, get the Starbucks to close just by using oh, the local ones. That's the dream, baby. That's the dream. But uh, anything else you buying and selling? 
No, I think that's it, man. I think your list was pretty solid. Um, and, you know, I, I just knew that coffee thing was on the horizon. So I'm glad you got a story coming with it. And that's awesome. Right on, guys. Well, that's all we have for this week. As always, uh, give us your questions, comments, concerns, complaints, uh, ne'er-do-well, long-form poetry, whatever it is that you want to do it in whatever format. We'd love to hear from you and uh, comment on your comments. So put them down there, yeah. or you can send them to me, Christopher at MidbayNews.com. And we will, as always, see you next week.